Thank you, Inga and Andy. Um, today I'm going to talk about the act of creation of prehistoric art, now on natural rock formations, how, of how it has been perceived over time and how its studies allows us to unveil connections with other spheres of human life in the Neolithic. For nearly a century, rock art studies focused on the second word, art. Carved rocks were shown as line drawings and classification tended to be seen as the ultimate aim of research. In the 1990s, these images were awarded a place in the landscape, mostly due to Richard Bradley's work. But we soon faced an awkward situation in which some scholars kept a too narrow focus, whereas others valued a view from afar or a view from above. Well, we tried to conciliate these views by looking at rock art dialectically from the landscape to the rock face. Having applied this idea to the study of rock art in Northern Portugal <coughs> for nearly two decades now, uh, it is perhaps time to assess how thinking rock art, rock art in terms of the processes of human interaction with the natural world, but also of how our individual approach to fieldwork methodology and recording techniques contributed to shed light on its so wider social and cultural context. Actually, the study of post-Paleolithic rock art in northern Portugal is particularly interesting for it is one of the few regions where it has been attested that two major European rock art traditions come together. Atlantic art that spans across Atlantic Europe from Northwest Iberia to the British Isles and schematic art that occurs uh, along Mediterranean regions. Coincidentally, they converge along the line that marks the transition between the Atlantic and Mediterranean biogeographical regions of Europe. It should be stressed, though, that each of these traditions comprises a common language of signs that has been interpreted by local communities differently from region to region. Well, let us then recall their main features. Atlantic art is materialized as carvings on open-air outcrops. It scatters across the landscape. The places allow movement around the rocks, and it mainly offers abstract and curvilinear designs. Whereas schematic art is typically, it's typically painted on in rock shelters, usually confined places opened on cliffs or rock outcrops. Here, the representation of the human figure is recurrent. Although this dichotomy was acknowledged by traditional investigation, rock art was studied to Percy. The Portuguese research tradition adopted methodologies much, much closer to art history than to archaeology. It focused on the analysis of the structural ordering of motifs in compositions and the techniques of execution, but strongly emphasized the accuracy, the rigor in recording. From the 1970s, direct tracing on transparent film became the most popular technique of recording. This method demands that we spend time on site, allowing the observation of technical details and the behavior of who created these images. We become closer to replicating their gestures and sharing their bodily experience during the act of carving or painting. In the turn of the century, a new generation of students, heirs of the, from the old school, were no longer worried in classifying motifs, but in exploring how the imagery engaged with rocks at several scales, from landforms to, natural, to the natural backdrop. Rock art was now to be seen as the sum of rock and art, meaning that studying the ways in which matter was manipulated <coughs> became as important as tracing the imagery itself. 
Years ago, we set out to investigate Atlantic and schematic art under this perspective, and today I shall illustrate some observations made in those days with two recently discovered sites in northern Portugal. An assemblage of carved rocks from Monte Faro, located <coughs> towards the coast, and the painted rock shelter of Lapas Cabreiras, inland in the Coa Valley. I argued that Atlantic art materializes a particular vision of the cosmos through outward dialogues, which are dialogues directed from the rock to the exterior. But this is achieved by molding matter, both phys physically and ideologically. Creating complex arrangements implies site selection and planning, knowledge of design grammar, the repertoire of motifs, and carving techniques. Actually, cutting circles or large circles in granite may be time consuming. And one of the techniques employed um, implied packing a series of cup marks on the hard rock following the sequence. And occasionally, we are able to grasp the neg negatives of cup marks underlying circular grooves, like in this unfinished motif. The methods employed were by no means discreet, as they involved long and rhythmic packing and hammering on rocks, reminding us the sound of drums. So not only Atlantic art spreads across white territories, but its very creation resonated across the landscape. In our case study, Monte Faro, the rock art shows the different ways in which the dialogue between the carvings and the natural backdrop may be established. There are flat surfaces with either complex or simple motifs. Um, there are rocks with um, a large number or a single motif. And, but there is recurrent evidence of motifs being intentionally carved on uneven surfaces, on bends in the rock, interacted with natural basins, motifs carved on natural circular lumps, or even just outlining naturally convex surfaces. The molding of granite assumes here a highly sculptural character, as many uneven surfaces were intentionally chosen to receive complex arrangements. In these particular cases, direct tracing is unsuitable for recording as it introduces unacceptable levels of distortion. And here is where photogrammetry became fundamental to capture and show the three-dimensional character of these carvings. But it has been also crucial to highlight severely weathered motifs like this. Here too, we see a circle. Let me see if I could, okay. This one here, a circle that has been carved on a circular lamp on the rock. And it is interesting to, know, to note that this particular surface here on the foreground faces the center of a basin where three lumps on the terrain correspond to three Neolithic circular mounds. And actually, it seems as if not only the image of the circle is all pervading, but the way in which megalithic tombs are molded on the land recall the ways in which cup and rings adhere to circular <coughs> convex surfaces. Being highly visible, Atlantic art scratches across the skin of the land to create what we once called exuberantly tattooed landscapes. Turning now to the schematic art tradition, we'll see how it encloses a contrasting approach to rocks. The arrow actually points to, towards the sites of Lapas Caveiras in the Coa Valley. Unlike Atlantic art, these sites may be visible from afar, but were probably not visited on a daily basis. Rock shelters are usually 
confined spaces, uh, which, which suggests that paintings were produced by few in intimate ceremonies. Because here we could not reach part of the decorated panel, and I'm actually standing there on the edge of the platform. And because the paintings are extremely faint, only photographic digital enhancement with this stretch allow us to unveil the splendor of this canvas. We were then, we were then able to identify several compositions created at different scales, human figures represented in different styles, the use of multiple colors ranging from red to orange to purple, with different techniques of execution from finger and brush painting to these rather unique motifs in orange, a schematic human figure with large hands and a single hand. And this is, these figures were obtained or produced by scrapping a crayon on the surface. So this imagery is basically produced on rocks with rocks. And in fact, painting these motifs is not particularly time consuming. A human figure can take only a few seconds to paint. After pebbles were scrapped and grinded, and pigments mixed with water or animal fat, red minerals return to the rock, now as symbolic designs. As opposed to carving, painting was actually a silent and solitary activity. We should also have in mind that in Neolithic Iberia, red ochre was used in passage graves, both as raw materials for painting but also to sprinkle as powder on the burial ground. And in fact, it's not uncommon to find grinding stones or palettes with red ochre preserved deposited in megalithic tombs. Therefore, not only schematic and megalithic art share at times the repertoire of motifs, the <coughs> use of red pigments, and several stages of the process of creation. But there, are, there is also the odd case of an animal bone decorated its schematic art imagery from, the, from a burial context. Also, we experience a similar feeling of reclusion in painted rock shelters as we do in the, the chambers of megalithic monuments. All these hints suggest that painted rock shelters might have been somehow related with the dead and they were perhaps sites used for discrete funerary um, practices like the deposition of relics, for instance. And to sum up, and I'll leave you here with this artwork from Mark Edmund and Rose Farabee's book, uh, Stonework to reflect upon these two ideas I'd like to stress here. First, that the study of rock art should ultimately seek to understand its role in the daily lives of prehistoric communities. And although we cannot reach its full meaning, thinking about the modes of becoming helps estab establishing wider connections to other spheres of human life. Second, by thinking about process, should not be separated from the relationship between praxis and theory in the production of knowledge in archaeology, which goal should be, well, in a rather humanistic perspective, the study of what John Barrett recently described as, and I quote, those historical conditions that facilitated the making of different kinds of humanness. Thank you.